All right, welcome to the Neutralize podcast once again. Today we are chatting with neurologist and author Richard Saitoic, and we will talk about synesthesia, which he bring to mainstream science in the 1980s. And we'll be talking about what it is, how you can train it in yourself, or can you? And also how it influences cognitive performance. So let's get straight into it. All right. Thank you, Richard Saitoic, for coming on the Neutralize podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Would you be so kind and start with explaining to us on a very basic level, what is synesthesia? All right, everybody knows the word anesthesia, which means no sensation, right? Mm -hmm. So synesthesia means joined or coupled sensation. And kids are born with two, three, or all five of their senses hooked together so that my voice, for example, is not only something that they hear, but they might also see it or taste it or feel it as a physical touch. Mm -hmm. They're quite surprised to discover that not everybody's like them. Right. So is it only uh, hereditary? Can you develop it by training in some way? No, it's, um, it's highly hereditary. Uh, 4% of the population or 1 in 23 people carry the genes for it. But you can't train yourself to do it any more than you can train yourself to have perfect pitch, for example. And that's what I like to compare synesthesia to. A lot of people assume that it's abnormal and that something needs fixing. And that's not the case at all. It's a perceptual trait, like having perfect pitch. Mm. And like perfect pitch, it's an all or nothing kind of phenomenon. You either have it or you don't have it. It manifests at a very early age without the need to train or develop it in any way. And it stays with you throughout your whole life. Hmm. You mentioned that there are genes that have been identified. What do we know about been, there are markers that have been identified on several chromosomes, the chromosome 16, for example, chromosome 4. What's interesting about uh, chromosome 4 is that that marker is shared by, by people with autism um, and epilepsy and synesthesia. And a good example of that is Daniel Tammet, the, uh, who won the European Prize for memorizing the most digits of pi. And he talks about his synesthesia and everything else in his uh, book, Born on a Blue Day. Mm -hmm. So how does synesthesia influence memorization? Because I that, guess that that is what he was very good at. Right. Well, if you ask people, you know, well, what good is this trait? I mean, it's very pretty to have. I mean, letters and numbers are colored and people have colors around them and everything. It's really sort of nifty. But what good does it do? And people will immediately say, well, it helps you remember. And that's because they have all these extra hooks to hang things on. And actually, I first um, just learned of the word synesthesia by reading a very old book by uh, the Soviet uh, neuropsychologist A.R. Luria called The Mind of a Nemanis, and he described a memory expert who had a five-fold synesthesia, and that gave him what Luria called a, a limitless and me memory without distortion. Wow. And so if you, mem if you measure synesthetes' memory with standardized tests, they, they, are very, they perform very high. Hmm. Are there any specific aspects of memory, such as episodic memory versus verbal memory, maybe? Or like, are there any specific aspects of tested memory in the neuropsychological literature that have been found to have a greater positive impact from synesthesia? Well, the memory... Um enhancement in synesthesia is very much like the, the method of loci. You know, the Roman senators would walk around their villa with their hand against the wall and in each part of the house, they'd memorize a certain section. And so when they went to give the speech, they similarly walked themselves back through the house. And so the place helped them remember what they, were, what they wanted to say. And for synesthetes, that's the same thing they'll say, oh, she had a green name. Let me see. These are green. So Denise, Darby, um, yo, yes, her name is Denise. Hmm. It's, it's sort of like spatial memory improvement. 
um, sp they have in, they have good spatial memory. They have good memory for everything, really, um, but particularly for but for place and for episodes. So they remember episodic memories um, because of a certain synesthetic quality it had. Oh, it tasted like spikes. Um, it was green with sparkles. It was, it was a certain oily feeling in my hand when we visited that place or you kissed me you'd be in front of the waterfall, whatever it might be. Right. What do we know about the neurological underpinnings of synesthesia? Well, we know a lot. So what do you mean? Can you be more specific? Yeah, I want you to tell us a bit about the... What's going on in the brain? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, it, what's happening during synesthesia is there, there are a greater number of cross connections in synesthetes compared to, to the rest of us. Now, cross connection exists in everybody. It's just that synesthetes have more of it and they're consciously aware that they have it. So, for example, uh, we all lip read. I'm looking at you now on the, via this video camera, but I'm looking at your face and your mouth to, under, to see what you're saying. Okay? And we do this all the time. The noisier it gets at a party, for example, the more we have to pay attention to, to what the person is saying via their face, body language, and all that. Um, cinema is another example, whereas we think that the dialogue is coming from the mouths on the, uh, on the screen, not the speakers that are surrounding us. Right. Even bad ventriloquists convince us that the dummy's talking because sight and sound are already so tightly linked in all of us. Hmm. And if you think back to a baby, I mean, they learn through what they learn through mimicry, don't they? Right. They learn through the the movement and the sound of mama, dada, etc. Mm -hmm. Right. So they're very synesthetic at that age. Hmm. So everybody is synesthetic at an early age. Actually, uh, Daphne Maurer at McMaster University in Canada uh, believes that every all infants are synesthetic up until about age three when they grow out of it. And I wouldn't say grow out of it so much as it then becomes suppressed by the development of other kinds of capacities in a, in a developing brain. Hmm. So all of us are synesthetic, um, even if only a, a little bit. And we can see that in metaphor, for example. We talk about sharp cheese. Well, why do we describe a taste in terms of a touch? And cheese isn't, isn't really sharp. It's rather soft, mostly. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, we talk about warm colors. Why is red a warm color? There's nothing thermal about it at all. Right. Unless you think of the sun. The, the sun is yellow and the sun is warm. So yellow is warm. So those, they're, they're, these are synesthetic metaphors. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So why do, I'm not sure I understand exactly what happens in the development of the brain that enables some people to have synesthetic experiences while I, for example, don't. With the same thing that makes some people epileptic or some people have migraines. I mean, why, why you and not? that person next to you and it, it's just the way that the brain develops. It's an interplay between nature and nurture. I mean, synesthesia is so interesting because you have to have two things. You have to have a genetic propensity to cross connect different kinds of, of sense, not only senses, but different kinds of abilities in the brain. But then you must also be exposed early in life to cultural artifacts, such as letters, numerals, the names of the foods that you eat, the clocks and how to tell time, and the, the points of a compass, things like that. Yeah. So one of the most interesting challenges still to, to me is how does this binding occur in early life? You know, we know that, you know, from, from zero to six months, the brain is undergoing an enormous reorganization. 
plane. And then, uh, and it is that during that time that synesthesia first appears, that it, it appears in the very, very early years, you know, usually around, certainly by three to four. But there's an exception. A small number of people say that around the time of puberty, they either lose it or they develop, develop it. I have a set of twins and said, oh, my twin brother did this too, but it, I, at our bar mitzvah, he lost it. You know, so there's something, and again, puberty is a time of enormous change, right? You grow hair, your voice changes, you develop breasts, and these are outward manifestations, but the brain is also undergoing a terrific reorganization around this time. Right. Back to you, it's, there's, a, there's an increase in these normal connections in synesthetes for reasons we don't quite understand. It has to do with the interplay of the, the genes that you inherit or that mutate in you uh, spontaneously and your exposure to cultural artifacts at an early age. Hmm. You mentioned memory enhancement locked earlier. Locked in, stays the same all your life. Yeah, right. Yeah. You mentioned me memory enhancements earlier. Yes. Are there any other positive effects from synesthesia on cognitive performance? Well, it tends to um, enhance creativity. So, um, you know, there are famous, famous artists who happen to be synesthetes, you know, Lady Gaga, David Hockney, the painter, Olivia Messiaen, the composer, Billy Joel. Um, but there are, if you take a bunch of synesthetes who aren't famous, you'll find that many of them pursue some kind of creative pursuit. They speak a foreign language or two, they play a musical instrument, they are involved in sculpture or make pottery or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that when you the other thing, what good does synesthesia do as a gene is that it may um, be responsible for uh, increased cross connections and thus be the basis for metaphor in all of us. Mm. So you know, when the gene is expressed in a sensory area, you have an overt synesthete, right? But what if that same gene is expressed in non-sensory areas, like the frontal lobes and the executive areas and areas for memory and emotion? Right. What happens then? Mm -hmm. Well, then you would have an ability to cross-connect seemingly unrelated things. Right. And that's the definition of metaphor, right? Seeing the similar in the dissimilar. Mm -hmm. So that... I think, I mean, this is, I can't prove it yet, but I think this is, um, it, it makes us more creative as a species. Mm -hmm. Because... 4% of the population is a huge number for an apparently useless gene to be hanging around. Right. It costs energy, and if it, if it doesn't do anything, evolution should have junked it a long time ago, but it didn't. Right. So it must be something of inapparent use for right. us to be around in such a great proportion of the, the population worldwide. Right. So... More associations is what I understand synesthesia. More connections. More connections. Associations is a sort of a mental thing. Connections is a physical thing. So there are more connections among different brain areas than, are other, than is otherwise normally the case. Hmm. So how would you label what happens in synesthesia improving creativity? Including, I didn't get the last part of that. Improving creativity. Well, because you have an ability to cross-connect things that on the face of it don't seem to go together. But yet, the creator person always sees a similarity in the dissimilar. I mean, that's what makes music and painting and, right. and writing. Right. So... They, they just, they have a... Their experience makes them... One, also oh, more open-minded to a whole bunch of possibilities and saying, that, no, that doesn't work. That doesn't go together. We can't do that. It's like, sure, why not? Anything is possible. Hmm. You know, if, my, if my numerals are colored and I, I see moving shapes when, when I get a pinprick or acupuncture, then sure, why can't I have X go with Z? Right. And so, therefore, you get the creativity. And, and then the artist part of you takes over and say, okay, I see, a, I see something similar between X and Z. Now, how can I articulate this hmm. in 
an expressive work. All right. So convergent creativity, is that a good label for what happens? Convergence creativity, sure, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, different things are coming together. Yeah. Right. This way, this way. Yeah, exactly. Um, and too much of convergent creativity, in my understanding at least, is connected to psychotic symptoms and psychotic experiences. Do you know if synesthesia has any impact on the likelihood of a person becoming psychotic? No, no, they're all quite n normal and sane in that respect. And also, we don't understand the neurobiology behind, let's say, schizophrenia or paranoid schizophrenia or manic depression things. So we know at some level, but we don't know anything about what different areas are doing or whether there's hyperconnection among them at all. Mm. Except it would be autism, where we know that there is much greater connection among brain areas. Mm. Are there any cons of synesthesia? Any drawbacks? Yeah. Well, I mean, there could be social embarrassment. I mean, when you say, oh, my A is the most beautiful pink I've ever seen. What does yours look like? You get withering looks from your, your, your schoolmates. Um, one girl was dragged to the principal's office when she said that the, when she saw her, when she kissed her boyfriend, she saw orange sherbet foam. And he thought, he thought you must be on drugs and we're, we're, you know, and of course she didn't even smoke cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But so there can be those embarrassing episodes, which are not too bad. Um, when it's difficult is, uh, let's take James Warnerton, who tastes words. And so when he, when, he, when he hears himself speak, when he thinks of a word, when he hears other people speak, each word has a specific taste to it, and they're not all pleasant. So, for example, sausage, the word message tastes like sausage, which is okay. Uh, but jail tastes like cold, hard bacon. Hmm. And then Derek tastes like earwax. And James used to own a pub in London. And he, after a number of years, he, he simply had to, he's had to sell it and stop because the chatter of all the patrons left such a taste in his mouth that he lost an enormous amount of weight. He couldn't eat, etc. So in, there can be times when it is unpleasant, but almost always, I would say 90, 95 to 99% of the time, it's, it's a delightful trait to have and to, to lose it would be an odious state. Synesthesia would be, oh my God, it would be like going blind to lose my synesthesia. No, I love it. I love it. The other time is when it goes in two directions. Normally, it's synesthesia is only a one-way street. So sound goes to sight, but sight doesn't go to sound. There are, again, a very small number of people in whom it does work in both directions, and then it becomes confusing. And so they, they lead a relatively restricted, quiet life. We clearly lack knowledge about the very specific and detailed questions regarding how synesthesia works in the brain. Right? Yes. Well, I mean, I've been at this for 40 years now, so the, every time you answer one question, 10 others pop up that you hadn't even realized were a question. Mm. So we do know a great deal about it, certainly much more than, than I knew back in 1979. Uh, and so there's still a lot more to do. And so I always encourage young scientists who are interested in this, I encourage them. I said, this is a great niche. You'll have a, you'll have a lifelong career because there's plenty of work to be done. Right. And well, it's mm -hmm. fascinating too. You, you said you think it's fascinating? Endlessly fascinating right. too. And the people are endlessly fascinating as mm -hmm. well. Right. What are the questions that you think are the most important in understanding how synesthesia works in the brain? Um, as I mentioned, the uh, how the link occurs in early 
childhood, what the nature of that is. And that's going to require studying prospective synesthetes from infancy on. So therefore, if you have a synesthetic parent, their child has a 50% chance of having the gene. Um, so you have to watch them and observe them. Of course, research in infants and young children is very, very difficult to do. It's expensive to do, um, but people are doing that, actually. So, you know, we, we'll make headway on that. The other thing I'd like to point out is something that uh, young students comment on when they choose to do a book report or whatever, or have me speak, and that's just think, a tiny change in your DNA completely alters the way you see the world. And this speaks to point of view. And so what young people come to realize is that, oh, my friend Jeannie, she's got synesthetic she, synesthesia. She sees things totally different than I do. Wow, other people see things differently too. And so it makes young people more sensitive to otherness and to other right. points of view. And in today's very divisive politics, which has now escalated to the level of all out war, it's useful to think that other people just see things differently than you see. And because right. you see it one way doesn't make you right. Right. Yeah. So I guess synesthesia is also maybe a tolerance gene for the rest of us. Right. Sort of increases the mindfulness of other people's experiences. Right. So on that point, could you, you mentioned earlier that you cannot train yourself to have synesthetic experiences. So but first of all, them. Again? You can ask them. So, for example, there's a wonderful, difficult study done by Roger Walsh at the University of California on meditators, and he had brand new novices, intermediate level, and then adept teachers. And what he found is that the more meditation experience you have, the more likely you were to have a synesthetic experience during your meditation. And so, as if he were uncovering the phenomenon and letting it express itself naturally. So maybe you already said that in the beginning of this sentence, but I didn't hear it. So you could actually meditate yourself to it, your, your way to synesthesia. You have, the more you have, you will increase the chances that you'll have a synesthetic experience um, during meditation. Hmm. I myself have had that, uh, and I, I see this, it's like a blue geode, a very cobalt blue geode, uh, and it doesn't mean anything, it's just there, you know, and it's my visual system doing its thing. Hmm. Um, Do you have... Again, Roger Wall showed that the more experience you had with meditation it, among the, the beginners, the intermediates, and then the teachers then the more likely you were to have, the more the greater the probability that you'd have a synesthetic experience. Mm. So don't take LSD, uh, learn to meditate if you want to have a synesthetic experience. Mm. But better yet, just try to understand um, what their point of view is and how they have a totally different texture of reality, I like to call it. Right. Often people will say, gee, doesn't it drive them crazy having to see all these extra things around them? And that would be like a blind person saying to you, oh, you poor thing. Everywhere you look, you're seeing something. Doesn't right. it drive you crazy always having to see everything? Yeah. Well, no, of course not, because vision is part of the texture of reality. And so synesthetes simply have a different texture of reality. Mm -hmm. One that mm -hmm. they think is really very pleasant. Right. So, so do you have synesthesia? No, I don't. But you meditated your way to having a synesthetic experience. Oh, now and then. I mean, not, not very much and all that. Mm -hmm. But then the question is, why did I believe these people when nobody else did? You know, the first 15 years, um, the press, like you, were very, very interested in synesthesia. Whereas my neurology colleagues said, oh, this is bogus. This can't be real. This, nothing's happening in the brain. They're making it up. They just want attention. They're remembering refrigerator magnets, and that's why A is red. 
or they're just having residual hallucinations from their hippie days. And uh, so why me? Why did I believe them? You know? And uh, the answer is that it sounded very familiar, you know, um, that uh, it has to do with the fact that I'm gay. And as a 10-year-old in New Jersey, my father's medical profession said that I was sick. The state said that I was a criminal. And the church said that I was doomed to hell. And I hadn't done anything. So, like, I wasn't supposed to be. And that's like, these people have no idea what they're talking about. So when people were telling me, synesthesia can't possibly be, it, it's, you know, it's bogus, totally made up, I thought, wow, this sure sounds familiar. I mean, you know, what's, right. what's the harm in looking and seeing? And that's what also struck me, too, was the hostility that I encountered. And it's like, well, it's simply a scientific question. What harm is there in, in right. looking? And it was like, no, no, don't. This is completely verboten. Hmm. That's interesting. What's behind that? Hmm. And I think what's behind that, of course, is it's true of any orthodoxy is that uh, they either deny or dismiss whatever it doesn't want to understand because it threatens their their worldview, you know, the or the orthodoxy framework. Right. And one of the things that synesthesia has done over the decades has caused a total paradigm shift in how we look at how the brain is organized and how sensation works. You know, we used to think you had five separate tubes, you know, <laughs> that went from your sense organs to the brain and there was no mixing in between. That was called modularity. It was the, it was the preeminent paradigm for decades. And of course, now we know that the brain is massively interconnected. You know, it's a wonder that there's any separation at all. Yeah. I found it very interesting that it was so unaccepted or so, yeah, unaccepted that people even had these experiences and so uh, unvalidated. Uh, I have had that same experience with Nootropics. Do you know what they are? Uh, nootropics are the sort of uh, limitless enhancing kind of med meds. Yes. Right, right, yeah. yeah. They are substances, not necessarily pharmaceutical medications. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least my view of them is that they are uh, either natural compounds or pharmaceutical compounds right. that can enhance cognitive performance and can be safe if they are used correctly. But I and that is essentially what we are trying to add neutralize, which is uh, uh, our brand and our company. We're trying to help people distinguish the nootropics that work from those that don't work mm -hmm. by, for one thing, gathering the small amount of high quality evidence that does exist regarding all of these substances. And right also enabling people to because there are a lot of people who use these even though there isn't a lot of actual high quality evidence but there are a lot of people who use these compounds so we try to enable them to log their experiences online uh, so that we can start to find where people rather researchers should start actually conducting high level science on That's, these compounds. Yeah. You know, I've written two columns about this in my Psychology Today column. So mm -hmm. maybe I invite you to do a guest column, if you like, to write about this topic, this neutralize right. uh, topic. Right. Yeah, we actually have a Psychology Today column, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. But we can talk about... Uh, you told me you've kept this a secret all this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> We can talk about that more after the podcast. Um, right. But I just found it fasc fascinating how how many people say that, in my experience, then nootropics are pseudoscience and that they are just BS. While because they don't fit their, stru their structural framework. Right, right. Now, you know, it, it may turn out that they are BS, you yeah. know, but you have to, you have to look and you right. have to do 
work to exactly. see if it's true or not. Right. But just dismiss it out of hand is not a good idea, I don't think. Right. Exactly. Now, there are some things that are so outlandish that you really do need to dis dismiss them out of hand. So, for example, mind reading. Well, there's no method of energetic coupling between one brain and another that would even be remotely plausible for that. So right. that would be an area that's probably not going to pay off in terms right. of positive results. Right. When there is actual research showing that something is definitely not true, then yes it should be dismissed but when there is a lack of research then can you say we don't know let's look and yeah. find out exactly yeah hmm. well i really enjoyed having this conversation with you thank you richard Saitolik, for coming on My the new podcast oh one more thing though yes um, you were gonna, how to reach me exactly how can people find you online um, I am very easily findable. You can go to my website, cytoic.net. That's C-Y-T-O-W-I-C dot net. I'm on Twitter at Cytoic. And of course, there's my latest book, Synesthesia, part of MIT Press's Essential Knowledge Series. It's a short compendium that answers all the questions you might have. Mm -hmm. We'll include, include links to those sources in the show notes and Thank you once again for coming on the Neutralize podcast. Thanks very much for having me. My pleasure.